Thank you for joining us today for our webinar for bank officers, employees, and other stakeholders. This seminar will cover the FDIC's amendments to Part 328, the FDIC's rule governing banks' use of the official FDIC sign and advertising statements, as well as rules related to false advertising and misrepresentations regarding deposit insurance coverage and misuse of the FDIC's name and logo. This rule, which was finalized in December 2023, modernizes the FDIC's requirements regarding the use of the official sign, which all insured banks have posted in their branches since the 1930s. Similarly, under the newly revised Part 328, all 4,500 plus insured banks across the country will now be required to post the new FDIC official digital sign on their websites and banking apps, which is where consumers continue to do more and more of their banking. In addition, the FDIC has seen deposit insurance misrepresentations on the internet by persons, including non-bank entities, in numerous forms. Deposit insurance misrepresentations can cause confusion and create uncertainty, which can erode consumers' confidence in banks and in protections afforded by the FDIC. Accordingly, the final rule also addresses this misconduct in internet banking channels by any person that misuses the FDIC name or logo or inaccurately describes FDIC deposit insurance coverage. One of the main goals of the final rule is to bring the certainty, safety, and confidence historically provided by the FDIC official sign and FDIC insurance to today's varied banking channels, including digital banking. The final rule is intended to help enable consumers to, one, better understand when they are dealing with an insured bank and when their funds are protected by the FDIC's deposit insurance coverage. In the fall of 2023, the FDIC launched its Know Your Risk, Protect Your Money public awareness campaign, which underscores the importance of understanding how deposit insurance works and how it protects consumers' money. You might have seen online advertisements from the campaign featuring Penny the Pig. The final rule complements that work. For today's discussion, I am one of your presenters. My name is Erin Berry, and I'm a Senior Policy Analyst in the Division of Depositor and Consumer Protection at the FDIC. And joining me today are Edward Hoff and Kirsten Binder, both subject matter experts focused on deposit insurance policy. Since the rule was finalized, we've received questions and had productive engagement with bankers, vendors, trade associations, technology service providers, and other Part 328 stakeholders as they are working to implement the final rule in advance of the January 1st, 2025 compliance date. This banker seminar will provide answers to certain questions we have received so far, and we hope to answer more questions during our question and answer session at the end of the call. This is the third of four seminars that FDIC staff plan to host on the final rule in 2024. The date of the last webinar will be announced at a later time to address bankers and other stakeholders' questions as needed. Slides from previous webinars are posted on the FDIC's website, as well as a recording of the July 31st webinar. To be clear, although the amendments to the final rule took effect on April 1st, 2024, the final rule included an extended compliance date of January 1st, 2025. Please note, however, the FDIC Board of Directors is meeting tomorrow, October 17th, and one agenda item is titled, Delay of Compliance Date for Subpart A Amendments to FDIC Official Sign and Advertising Rule. So more, on, more details to come on that topic tomorrow. Institutions, however, may comply with the amendments to the final rule before the compliance date. For example, for several months, FDIC staff has seen that some banks are already displaying the new FDIC official digital sign on their websites. Today, we will walk through the new rule, 
describe the primary new requirements, and answer your questions. We will start with a few slides to give a big picture overview. Then we get into the details of Part 328, Subpart A, which is the part that applies specifically to insured banks and deals with the FDIC official signs and advertising statement. I should note here that for today's presentation, we'll be using the word bank as a shorthand way of referring to FDIC insured depository institutions. And then we cover the misrepresentation portion of the rule, which is part 328, subpart B. If you have questions along the way, please drop them into the chat box and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end of the session. We will not be able to address all questions that are submitted today. However, FDIC staff will continue to evaluate questions that have been received, and we will consider making additional questions and answers publicly available to facilitate effective compliance by the compliance date. CFR Part 328 has been around for the FDIC's near century long history. The FDIC's mission is to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system by, among other priorities, ensuring bank deposits. The FDIC has helped to maintain public confidence in the nation's banking system in times of financial turmoil. Since the 1930s, the black and gold FDIC official sign has been displayed next to bank branch teller windows to give bank customers confidence that they are dealing with an FDIC insured bank and that their deposits are safe. Also since the 1930s, banks have been required to use the member FDIC statement or logo in advertisements, indicating the advertisement was from an FDIC insured bank and it was probably an advertisement for deposit products. These signs, images, and logos, to a certain extent, have become woven into the fabric of banking over the last 90 plus years. Consumers are used to seeing that. At the same time, the business of banking and how consumers bank has substantially changed, and the FDIC's sign and advertising regulation was updated in part to keep pace with these developments. Prior to the issuance of the final rule we're discussing today, the last regulatory update was in 2006, before smartphones and before banking apps were widely used. There have also been significant market and technology developments and consumer banking habits have substantially changed since 2006. Everyone participating in this webinar is aware of the substantial changes that have taken place in the banking industry. Therefore, I do not plan to discuss each point on this slide. Suffice it to say, many consumers use their bank's website or mobile banking apps as their primary method of accessing banking products. It means these digital banking channels essentially serve as banks' digital teller windows. In addition, growth in the fintech sector has introduced deposit and other banking products offered by non-bank entities. These developments in the banking industry can serve to blur the distinction between A, banks and non-bank entities, and also between B, deposit and non-deposit products, potentially creating confusion for some consumers who bank online. In addition, and at the same time, the FDIC has observed an increase in misleading representations about deposit insurance online, which can create uncertainty and dilute and undermine the public confidence that underpins banks and our nation's financial system. The FDIC has proactively sought to protect consumer deposits and promote public confidence by limiting the use of the FDIC's name, seal, and logo to insured banks, and by taking action to prevent false and misleading representations about the manner and extent of FDIC deposit insurance. Now, I will turn it over to Kirsten Binder to talk about how the final rule addresses these issues. Thanks, Erin. 
The final rule amends 12 CFR Part 328, which governs the use of the official FDIC sign and advertising statement to reflect how depositors interact with banks today, including through digital and mobile channels. The final rule includes a number of amendments of Part 328. For example, the final rules sign requirements under Subpart A, which again applies only to banks, now include three distinct signs for banks relating to deposit insurance. The first is the FDIC's official sign, which is currently displayed at banks' principal places of business and branches. This is the black and gold sign we are all used to seeing at teller windows. The second is a new FDIC official digital sign, which banks will be required to display on their digital deposit-taking channels, such as online banking websites and mobile applications. This FDIC official digital sign is intended to promote a clear understanding by consumers of when they are interacting directly with the bank rather than with a non-bank entity and when their funds are insured by the FDIC. Third, to address potential consumer confusion, the final rule includes a non-deposit sign requirement where a bank offers both insured deposits and non-deposit products through the same channel, such as when both insured deposits and non-deposit products are offered at a branch. Subpart B, which addresses misrepresentations, applies to any person, including banks as well as non-banks, and prohibits any person from misusing the name or logo of the FDIC or from engaging in false advertising or making knowing misrepresentations about deposit insurance. The changes to Subpart B clarify application of the misrepresentation statute in specific situations where consumers may misunderstand or be misled as to whether an entity is insured by the FDIC, whether a particular product is FDIC insured, or the nature and extent of deposit insurance coverage. Subpart B also includes a consumer disclosure provision. It clarifies that if a person makes a statement regarding deposit insurance in a context where deposits and non-deposit products are both offered on a website in close proximity, it is generally a material omission to fail to clearly and conspicuously differentiate between insured deposits and non-deposit products by disclosing that non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. As mentioned earlier, please note the FDIC Board of Directors is meeting tomorrow, October 17th, and one agenda item is titled Delay of Compliance Date for Subpart A, Amendments to FDIC Official Sign and Advertising Rule. Additional information about topics that are covered during the FDIC Board meeting will be made available to the public after the meeting concludes on Thursday. The policy objectives of the final rule go to the core of the FDIC's mission of maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's banking system. The final rule modernizes the FDIC official sign and advertising rules to ensure the regulation keeps pace with significant changes that have taken place in the banking industry and reflects how consumers do business with banks today. To keep current with marketplace changes, and mitigate potential consumer confusion, the final rule requires banks to display across all of their banking channels consumer disclosure signs differentiating insured deposits and uninsured non-deposit products. These consumer disclosure signs will be displayed in bank branches and other physical premises and on bank websites, mobile applications, and deposit-taking automated teller machines. These requirements align the FDIC's sign rules with market developments and consumer banking habits. The final rule also clarifies the FDIC's false advertising and misrepresentation rules to address misconduct by persons, including non-bank entities, that are misusing the FDIC name or logo and inaccurately describing FDIC deposit insurance coverage. Importantly, both of these objectives, that is, modernizing the FDIC sign rules and clarifying the misrepresentation rules, will enable consumers to better understand when they are dealing with a bank and when their funds are protected by the FDIC's deposit insurance coverage. In addition, the final rule fulfills the goal of creating a policy that is cons as consistent as possible across different banking channels. We're going to dive into some detail now, starting with the new Subpart A requirements that apply to bank branches and other physical premises, like cafe-style locations or tellerless bank locations, where consumers have access to or transact with deposits.
But before we talking about the new rules for cafes and other bank locations without teller windows, we'll start with requirements for posting the FDIC official sign in a typical bank branch with teller windows. In these sorts of branches, banks have new options. Under the old Part 328, banks had to post the official sign next to each teller window. Under the new rule, banks can continue to follow that approach if they would like to, but they also have new flexibility. For example, if non-deposit products are not offered at a branch, banks can continue to display the official sign at each teller window, or they can replace the teller-based signs with one or more official signs that are visible from the teller windows and large enough to be legible from the deposit area. In addition, banks have the option of displaying the official sign on electronic media. So a branch can comply with the in-branch physical official sign requirements of Part 328 by posting the official sign on a TV screen, but that electronic version of the official sign must meet the other sign requirements, and it must be clear, continuous, and conspicuous. Before it was updated, Part 328 applied to bank branches, but it didn't necessarily cover other retail bank locations where consumers can make deposits. The updated Part 328 is broader. It applies to bank branches and other physical premises where consumers have access to or can transact with deposits. Cafes are one example of other physical premises, but not the only one. In physical bank locations that do not have teller windows or stations, like cafe-style locations, the deposit-taking area may not be well-defined. The old Part 328 may not have applied to some of these locations if they were not technically considered branches. But under the revised Part 328, these other physical locations where bank customers have access to or transact with deposits, the new requirement is to display the official sign in one or more locations in a size large enough to be legible anywhere in the deposit taking area. And here again, just like in a branch with teller windows, Part 328 provides banks a new option to post the official sign in bank branches on electronic media. That new flexibility applies to all applicable physical locations covered by Part 328. As a result, the official sign can now be displayed in a larger size on a TV screen or a tablet or some other electronic media at bank branches and other physical locations. Those approaches can be consistent with the revised Part 328 as long as the other requirements of the regulation are satisfied, such as clear, continuous, and conspicuous. And now I'll turn it over to Edward Hoff, Senior Policy Analyst in DCP Supervisory Policy. Thanks, Kirsten. Part 328 also has new requirements for bank branches and other physical premises where consumers are offered non-deposit products. Before getting to the new requirements, let's start with a definition. Part 328 updated the definition of non-deposit product in part to include the term crypto asset. This change was intended to clarify that representations regarding deposit insurance in connection with crypto assets falls within the scope of Part 328. That is, crypto assets are non-deposit products under Part 328. In addition, credit products and safe deposit boxes are not considered non-deposit products for the purposes of Part 328. With that as a definition, Part 328 will require banks to post a non-deposit sign in bank branches and other premises where both deposits and non-deposit products are offered. More specifically, at each location within the premises where non-deposit products are offered, banks should continuously, clearly, and conspicuously display non-deposit signs indicating that non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. This approach may sound familiar because these requirements are generally consistent with the practices described in the long-standing interagency guidance on the retail sale of non-deposit investment products. That guidance from 1994 describes how consumers should be notified that non-deposit products are not FDIC insured, not deposits, and may lose value. 
The guidance also discusses physically separating the deposit and non-deposit areas when practicable. Under Part 328, the sign requirements in physical locations depend on the layout and services available in the branch. For example, in a branch that has teller windows and also offers non-deposit products, the official sign should be next to each teller window. So banks won't have the flexibility to replace each teller window with one or more larger official signs. In addition, the non-deposit area generally must be physically segregated from the deposit area. And in the non-deposit area, banks will have to post a non-deposit sign indicating that non-deposit products are not FDIC insured, not deposits, and may lose value. Another type of bank layout is one where there are deposits and non-deposit products, but no teller windows, such as a cafe type setting or similar bank location. The layouts are different than traditional bank branches, so it can be harder for consumers to tell the difference between the deposit taking teller area and the non-deposit area. And because of that, because the setting and space is not really well defined to help bank customers differentiate the deposit area from the non-deposit area, there's an increased possibility of consumer confusion related to insured deposits and non-deposit products. To address that, the regulation adds definition to both the deposit taking area and the non-deposit area. More specifically, banks have to display the FDIC official sign where deposits are usually and normally accepted in a size that is large enough so that it is legible from the deposit taking area. And for the non-deposit area, banks must generally physically segregate those areas from the deposit area, display the non-deposit sign, and avoid displaying the non-deposit sign in close proximity to the official sign. I want to take a moment uh, to answer some of the questions that we've received so far about bank branches. Uh, one question we've heard is about the new requirement to generally segregate the non-deposit area from the deposit taking area and whether banks need to build separate rooms for the non-deposit product areas. As mentioned earlier, generally segregating the non-deposit area from the deposit taking area should be familiar since this is generally consistent with the 1994 interagency guidance on the retail sale of non-deposit investment products. There are many ways to physically separate the deposit and non-deposit areas. Non-deposit products could be offered in separate rooms or spaces separated from where deposits are taken. In addition, banks could use a desk, cubicle, partitions, railings, planters, or some other arrangement to indicate that the non-deposit area is distinct and separate from the deposit taking area. We have also been asked for clarification on the term continuous. As noted earlier, in bank branches and other fiscal premises, banks have a new option to display the official sign on electronic devices, such as TV screens, for example. However, the official sign must be continuously displayed. As a result, if the official sign is posted on a large monitor, but is part of a rotating display, that would not comply with the regulation because it would not be continuously displayed. We've also received questions about whether the non-deposit sign requirements apply to a branch network or on a per branch basis. If a bank's branch network has some branches that offer non-deposit products and other branches that do not, the non-deposit sign requirements apply only to those branches where non-deposit products are offered. As mentioned earlier, the final rule created a new FDIC official digital sign for use on bank websites, apps, and ATMs. The final rule requires that the digital sign look as shown on this slide. However, 
If due to co the color of the background of a page, the navy blue and black lettering is illegible, then the digital sign can be displayed in white. I'll now discuss the requirements related to the FDIC official digital sign, starting with bank ATMs. The final rules provisions apply to banks' deposit-taking ATMs, or like devices. In some cases, where there is a deposit-taking ATM or like device, the owner of the ATM and the bank may not be the same. In determining whether an ATM or like device is a bank's, the FDIC will consider circumstances such as the ATM or like device's location, branding, whether it is operated by the bank, and other factors that reasonably indicate whether it is a bank's ATM. Previously, bank ATMs were not required to display any FDIC official sign. Under the revised Part 328, a bank's ATM or like device, such as an interactive teller machine, that receives deposits must display the FDIC official digital sign electronically on certain ATM screens. The digital sign must be clear, continuous, and conspicuous on the home screen and each transa transaction screen relating to deposits. If an ATM does not offer access to non-deposit products and was put into service before January 1st, 2025, the final rule provides flexibility to meet the signage requirement. In this case, the bank can display the physical FDIC official sign by physically attaching it to the ATM, or it can choose to display the official digital sign electronically. The rule requires ATMs that both receive deposits and offer access to non-deposit products to display the FDIC official digital sign clearly, continuously, and conspicuously on the home page or screen and on each transaction page or screen relating to deposits, and display the non-deposit sign on each transaction page or screen relating to non-deposit products clearly, continuously, and conspicuously, indicating that non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. The signage cannot be displayed in close proximity to the FDIC official digital sign. We've received some questions about which ATM pages should include the FDIC official digital sign. As noted in one of the Q&As on the FDIC's website, the regulation does not provide an exhaustive list of what constitutes each page or screen relating to deposits. However, to provide an example, if an IDI's customer is depositing funds at the IDI's ATM, then the final rule requires display of the FDIC official digital sign on pages relating to that transaction. Similarly, if an IDI's customer is transferring funds between deposit accounts at their IDI's ATM, then the digital official sign is required on those transaction pages or screens. In contrast, if an IDI customer is only checking their balance, those pages or screens are not transactional for purposes of Part 328. Therefore, the digital official sign is not required on those non-transaction pages. Now I'll turn it back over to Kirsten to talk about the new FDIC official digital sign on websites and apps. Before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit about clear, continuous, and conspicuous, since we've used that phrase a lot with regards to the new FDIC official sign and the new non-deposit sign. And we are about to use it a lot more when we start talking about websites and banking apps. You are likely familiar with clear and conspicuous language from the regulations Z and E. 
The FDIC interprets Part 328's usage of clear and conspicuous to be consistent with how those terms have been interpreted by FTC guidance on effective disclosures in digital advertising to mean something that is hard to miss and easy to understand by ordinary consumers. Something that is clear and conspicuous should stand out based on its size, contrast, location, and the length of time it appears. Regarding the length of time, the final rule adds continuous to the clear and conspicuous standard to emphasize that the FDIC official digital sign and non-deposit sign need to be continuously visible and therefore cannot rotate through different messages or disappear while customers are using the ATM, website, or app. Now we are going to move from the physical space to the digital space. Earlier, we mentioned that one policy goal of the rule is to be as consistent as possible across banking channels. The FDIC official digital sign on bank websites and apps will help with that. The idea is to provide online banking customers a disclosure similar to FDIC official signs in physical locations. The traditional black and gold sign next to teller windows reminds consumers that they are interacting with an FDIC insured bank. The black and gold sign in bank branches communicates that A, they're dealing with the bank, B, if the bank fails, the deposits are FDIC insured, and C, that FDIC insurance is backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. It's a reminder, a signal of safety, and it reassures consumers. The new FDIC official digital sign is intended to do the same on banks' digital deposit-taking channels, like bank websites and apps. Accordingly, with respect to banks' websites and bank apps, banks will be required to display clearly, continuously, and conspicuously the FDIC official digital sign on the bank's homepage, landing and login pages or screens, and transactional pages or screens involving insured deposits. The FDIC official digital sign displayed near the top of the page and in close proximity to the bank's name would be considered clear and conspicuous. This will help address potential consumer confusion and clearly distinguish a bank website from a non-bank's website. On these pages where the new official digital sign will be posted, banks will have the option of removing the member FDIC or member, F member FDIC advertising statement if they chose to do so. The digital sign requirement does not have to overlap with the advertising statement requirements that apply to banks, but banks are permitted to display both signs, provided they are in compliance with the FDIC official digital sign requirements. In addition, under the final rule, banks will have the option to use FDIC insured as a short form of the official advertising statement to satisfy the FDIC's requirements. So banks could use member FDIC, member of FDIC, or FDIC insured in certain advertisements. The ability to use FDIC insured rather than member FDIC or member of FDIC is not specific to just websites or digital banking channels. It applies to bank advertisements more broadly, including TV and radio ads. In terms of location, the new FDIC official digital sign would be considered clear and conspicuous if it is continuously displayed near the top of the relevant page or screen and in close proximity to the insured depository institution's name. Remember, to be clear and conspicuous, the sign needs to be hard to miss and easy to notice and understand by ordinary consumers. Here's a visual of what that could look like on a bank's website. This is just one example. There is no one-size-fits-all approach here, as long it is, as it is near the top of the relevant page and in close proximity to the bank's name, the rules requirements are satisfied. For example, the FDIC digital sign could be located above the bank's name, to the right of the bank's name, or below the bank's name. But under all circumstances, digital sign must be in close proximity to the bank's name.
because a case-by-case -case analysis for compliance is necessary. Placing the new digital official sign of one standard place on every website will not suffice. For example, for some banks, placing the digital sign at the top of the web page could cause it to be in close proximity to the bank's name, but placing the digital sign in the same location on another bank's website may not result in the digital sign being conspicuous and in close proximity to the bank's name. Over time, as consumers get used to seeing this official digital sign, we believe it will register for consumers that this is a signal to them that they are interacting directly with an insured bank and their deposited funds are protected by the FDIC's deposit insurance coverage. And if they get on a non-bank entity's website, which is not permitted to post the FDIC official digital sign, the goal is that consumers notice when the official digital sign is not posted on those non-bank websites, creating a noticeable, conspicuous difference between bank websites and non-bank websites. We wanted to share some of the most common questions we received about the FDIC official digital sign. The most common questions we've received are about the design of the digital sign and how to make it fit onto a smaller cell phone screen. To answer, we have to go back to the final rule. The final rule provides the image of the sign and clarifies that in general, the FDIC and the FDIC official digital sign shall be displayed with a word mark size of 37.36 by 15.74 pixels in navy blue, and the FDIC insured, backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, shall be in italic 12.8 font and in black. However, if the image sizing generally required by the final rule does not fit a particular device or screen, the image can be scaled proportionally to fit the relevant screen. If the image is scaled in that manner, the display of the digital sign still must be clear and conspicuous. A sign near the top of the relevant page or screen and in close proximity to the IDI's name and visually consistent with the image shown in the final rule would be considered clear and conspicuous. The next slide has an image of the digital sign wrap. Finally, we've been asked how to procure the official FDIC digital sign. The FDIC has made optional versions of the official digital sign available for IDIs on FDIC Connect, which is a secure website operated by the FDIC that FDIC insured institutions can use to exchange information with the FDIC. The requirement to display the new FDIC official sign only applies to IDIs. Display of the FDIC official digital sign by any non-bank third party would improperly imply that the non-bank is FDIC insured and would consist, constitute a misrepresentation under Part 328, Subpart B. As I just mentioned, here's an image of the official digital sign wrapped near the top of the page and in close proximity to the bank's name, any town bank. The newly established FDIC official digital sign is required to be placed on the bank's homepage, landing and login pages, or screens, and transactional pages or screens involving insured deposits. And we received some questions about which pages are pages where consumers transact with deposits. Some examples of pages where consumers transact with deposits are if they are on the bank's app and depositing a check remotely, that's an example of transacting with deposits. Similarly, if a consumer is on a bank website or app and transferring funds between deposit accounts at the bank, that's another example of transacting with deposits. On the other hand, the FDIC would not expect an IDI to display the FDIC official digital sign on pages where a customer is transferring money from a deposit account to a non-deposit account. Similarly, we received questions about whether banks will be required to post the official FDIC digital sign on specific pages, such as non-transactional account dashboards or portals. The short answer is no. If we're talking about an account summary webpage or screen on an app that typically displays a customer's financial information regarding various products after logging in, but where a customer does not transact with deposits, 
then the digital sign is not required. For the purposes of Part 328, a dashboard or portal as described here is not an initial homepage, is not an initial or homepage, landing or login page, or a page where a customer may transact with deposits. This image and Q&A can be found on FDIC.gov as well. When a bank offers both deposit and non-deposit products on its digital deposit taking channels, it must display a non-deposit sign indicating that non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. This non-deposit sign must be displayed clearly, conspicuously, and continuously on each page, bank page relating to non-deposit products. There is no size or design requirement for how this statement is displayed, provided that the message is displayed clearly, continuously, and conspicuously. I am going to turn this over to Ed. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, as far as where the non-deposit sign should be displayed, an IDI must clearly and conspicuously display a non-deposit sign on each page relating to non-deposit products if the IDI offers both access to deposits and non-deposit products. This signage must be displayed continuously on each page relating to non-deposit products. Regarding placement of the sign, an example of clear and conspicuous placement of the non-deposit sign is to place it in close proximity to where access to a non-deposit product is provided on each page relating to non-deposit products. The slide here provides some images, which are also in the Q&As posted on FDIC.gov. So it can be a helpful resource, not just for examiners, but also for bankers looking for additional information. In addition to the static non-deposit sign, the final rule also includes a narrowly tailored requirement for banks to provide a one-time non-deposit notification in limited situations to address the risk of consumer confusion. This notification is required when a bank customer accesses non-deposit products from a non-bank third party's website through a hyperlink, for example, from a bank's digital deposit taking channel. The notification is only required for bank customers who are logged in to the bank's digital deposit taking channel and is required one time per web session. The notification needs to clearly and conspicuously indicate that the third party's non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. We're now going to move on to subpart B of part 328. We've covered most of subpart A, and after we talk about subpart B, we'll come back to subpart A to discuss the new policies and procedures requirements for banks. In recent years, the FDIC has observed an increase in the number of instances where financial service providers, other entities, or individuals have engaged in false advertising or made misrepresentations about FDIC insurance coverage on the internet in violation of Section 18A4 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. For example, the FDIC has seen situations where companies in relationships with FDIC-insured banks, such as for the placement of customer deposits, have made false statements on the company's websites, stating or suggesting that the company is itself FDIC-insured or that its uninsured financial products are insured by the FDIC. In other instances, com companies have misused the FDIC logo or failed to identify an FDIC-insured bank that may hold customer funds. These types of misrepresentations and omissions have potential to harm consumers. The facts and circumstances of these situations vary on a case-by-case -case basis. 
The FDIC website includes information about persons or entities that have made false or misleading representations about the existence of deposit insurance, misused the name or logo of the FDIC, or knowingly misrepresented the extent or manner of deposit insurance. For more specific examples, you can see the list of cease and desist letters on the FDIC's website on a page titled Prohibition under Section 18A4 of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. Unlike Subpart A, which applies only to banks, Subpart B applies to any person, including banks and non-bank entities. So what authority does the FDIC have over any person that makes a misrepresentation about deposit insurance? Under the FDI Act, the FDIC has broad statutory authority in this area to investigate and take administrative enforcement actions, issue cease and desist orders, and impose civil money penalties against any person who misuses the FDIC name or logo or makes misrepresentations about deposit insurance. If the FDIC becomes aware of conduct that the FDIC has reason to believe violated a civil law or regulation within the jurisdiction of another regulatory agency, we can notify the appropriate authority. Subpart B of 328 includes examples of specific statements and material omissions that constitute a misrepresentation. The examples are intended to provide clarity and are a non-exhaustive list of what may violate Part 328. Final rule is intended to enable consumers to better understand when they are conducting business with an insured depository institution and when their funds are protected by the FDIC's deposit insurance coverage. For example, an important clarification in the final rule is about a situation where deposits and non-deposit products are being offered to consumers in close proximity on a website in ways that fail to distinguish which products are insured by the FDIC and which are not. The final rule provides that if a person makes statements regarding deposit insurance, in a context that involves both deposits and non-deposit products, it is generally a material omission to fail to disclose that non-deposit products are not insured by the FDIC, are not deposits, and may lose value. Another example is a non-bank's use of either the official FDIC sign or the new FDIC official digital sign which would be a misrepresentation if the non-bank inaccurately implies that the non-bank is insured by the FDIC and backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. The second example on this slide has to do with statements that inaccurately state or imply that a non-bank is FDIC insured. Absent additional context, such statements may suggest that the FDIC's deposit insurance will protect consumers in the event of the non-bank's insolvency. This can confuse consumers who may mistakenly think that deposit insurance protects them if the non-bank entity files for bankruptcy. For this sort of situation, the final rule provides that if a non-bank makes statements regarding deposit insurance for its customers, it is a material omission for the non-bank to fail to clearly and conspicuously disclose that it is not FDIC insured and that the FDIC's deposit insurance coverage only protects against the failure of an FDIC insured depository institution. The fourth example is about a non-bank making statements that suggest or imply an advertised product is FDIC insured. In that situation, it is a material omission to fail to clearly and conspicuously disclose the name of the banks that may hold customer funds. 
And in the final example, this one relates to pass-through deposit insurance coverage, which has been around for a long time. Pass-through insurance refers to a situation where, for example, a bank's deposit client, often a non-bank entity, maintains a transaction account at the bank on behalf of its customers. The customer's funds are often commingled in this account, and the non-bank entity maintaining the account keeps track of how much money of their customers, of each customer, have on deposit. There could be hundreds or thousands of customers' funds in these accounts. If the bank fails and certain conditions are met, deposit insurance passes through the non-bank entity. As a result, each underlying customer's deposits would be insured as if the customer had deposited their money directly at the bank, up to $250,000 per customer, rather than up to a total of $250,000 for all the funds in the account. It has become increasingly common for many non-banks to enter into arrangements to deposit their customers' funds at banks, with non-banks often claiming to provide the protection of pass-through deposit insurance for consumers' funds, almost as if it is guaranteed or automatic. Such representations may mislead consumers and fail to apprise them of the risks they face in the event that the pass-through deposit insurance requirements have not been satisfied. To address this situation, the final rule provides that if a person makes statements regarding pass-through deposit insurance for its customers' funds, it is a material omission to fail to clearly and conspicuously disclose that certain conditions must be satisfied for pass-through deposit insurance coverage to apply. Now I'll hand it back over to Kirsten, who will discuss policies and procedures and Part 328 implementation. Thanks, Ed. Now I want to go back to Subpart A and talk a little bit about bank policies and procedures required under the final rule. I wanted to talk about these requirements after talking about Subpart B because while these requirements are under Subpart A, they are tied to both Subpart A and Subpart B. Under the final rule, banks must establish written policies and procedures to achieve compliance with Part 328 that are commiserate with the nature, size, complexity, scope, and potential risk of the deposit-taking activities of the bank. A bank's policies and procedures must include, as appropriate, provisions related to monitoring and evaluating activities of third parties that either, one, provide deposit-related services to the bank, or two, offer the bank's deposit-related products or services to other parties to ensure compliance with Part 328, Subpart E. For example, if the bank offers a deposit account through or by a non-bank third party on a consumer-facing website with the branding and marketing of a non-bank third party, it would be appropriate for the bank to include provisions in its policies and procedures to monitor and evaluate the third party's compliance with Part 328. The IDI may also consider steps that it would take to mitigate any misrepresentations related to deposit insurance that could cause potential consumer confusion and harm regarding a product provided by the bank. This new requirement is consistent with the interagency guidance on third-party relationships risk management that was issued last year. The interagency guidance underscores that a banking organization's use of third parties can increase its risk and that the use of third parties does not diminish or remove a banking organization's responsibility to perform all activities in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with applicable laws and regulations, including those related to consumer protection. The bank's policies and procedures could include, for example, measures that the bank would take to ensure compliance with the sign-in advertising requirements when the bank changes its advertising strategy or engages with 
or expands into new physical or digital deposit taking channels. For example, this could include, if applicable, establishing procedures to ensure that the bank's technology, including websites and mobile applications, is capable of implementing the final rules, signs, and advertising statement requirements across all digital deposit taking channels. Banks are not required to be in full compliance with the final rules provisions until the compliance date. Although they should engage in implementation efforts now, including developing plans and other taking other appropriate steps to ensure timely compliance. As noted earlier, the FDIC Board of Directors is meeting tomorrow, October 17th, and one agenda item is delay of compliance date for subpart A, amendments to FDIC official sign and advertising rule. The FDIC will provide the public with additional information about the board meeting's agenda items after the board meeting concludes. Since finalizing the rule, the FDIC has been engaged in implementation activities. For example, this is the third of four seminars the FDIC will host in 2024 for bankers and other stakeholders to provide an overview of the final rule and to answer your questions through a Q&A session. We have met with technology service providers, trade associations, and banks as they work to implement the official digital sign and requ other requirements before the compliance date. In addition, since the rule was issued, we published a financial institution letter 56 2024 in August of 2024. The financial institution letter announced the availability of questions and answers addressing the most frequently asked questions that the FDIC has received from final rule stakeholders. These Q&As are posted on the FDIC's website. Thank you for attending our webinar.